Good morning again. We're going to be in the book of Galatians. If, you want, if you've got a Bible and you want to follow along, you can. Uh, if not, they'll be on the screen up here for you as we get to it and as time comes to it. Thank you for the prayers over the last couple of weeks. We, uh, our household has been through the, the COVID gauntlet. Uh, we managed to not have anybody get it seriously, but we have managed to get it evenly spaced apart, about five or six days apart, so that our house has kind of remained shut down for an extended period of time. But uh, I'm thankful to be able to get back with you and be with you this morning. I'm uh, well outside of the parameters of uh, quarantine time at this point. I'm about 14 days removed or so at this point. So uh, feeling good and glad to be back with you and start a, a new series. Um, this morning, I'm going to spend a little time uh, in this series kind of uh, bearing a little bit about kind of uh, myself and some of my journey uh, because this book kind of does that to me. Uh, the book of Galatians will uh, has challenged me in many ways and will continue to challenge me uh, as we go through it uh, because it is a book that uh, deals a lot with legalism. And uh, I <coughs> consider myself a, a bit of a, uh, I, I call myself a recovering legalist, uh, which means I still have to go to the meetings and uh, I have to go through the steps and I have to watch myself or, or I, else I, lest I fall right back into legalism. Um, because it, it sometimes in my heart and in my mind, uh, while you probably won't ever see it in my preaching, hopefully, uh, it still creeps back into my heart and my thoughts and my thinking. Um, I wasn't raised in, uh, a, a, this is not really a what I would call a, you know, I always want to be careful because I'm not talking about being raised in some way or that sort of thing. I'm just coming to share with you kind of how my heart uh, became formed and it's my own doings and Satan's doings. Uh, nobody else is to blame. Uh, but uh, I, I would say that in my, my life, I've struggled with legalism. And we're going to talk a lot about legalism through this, uh, through this book because it's really a, a book solely written for that. And so I ask myself, why do we struggle or why have I struggled with legalism in my life? And uh, that's a, a complex question. Um, this morning while I was in the shower, you know, so good, good things come to you while you're sitting in the shower. Um, I was in the shower and I was just thinking about that question. And I've been thinking about it this week, but I, I thought about something this morning that I had not thought about all week as it's been going through my mind. And um, so this is a, a shower thought. Um, I had an instance when I was a kid. I was probably uh, not a kid. I was a teenager, a young teenager, I would say. And we were um, studying uh, for a, a debate, okay? And uh, some of you, if you weren't raised in the Church of Christ tradition, we in the Church of Christ, have, have lo we love our debates uh, tr traditionally. Uh, and they've typically led to more division than unity on things. Um, but as debates will, when you start out with the instance that we're going to argue with each other instead of learn from each other, then we're, you're not going to get very far. And so we were uh, practicing for a, a mock debate. Uh, we had these mock debates, and the mock debates were, you know, you had to take both sides of an issue, but it was very clear uh, at least what side we were expected or not expected to fall on. So I, I look back to some of those things, and I really regret some of the things I said because I don't even agree with me uh, when I was falling on the right side of things back then. But I had a friend, and he had been converted uh, into the Churches of Christ from the Baptist Church. And uh, I don't think he'll watch this. He may catch it. I don't know. Uh, we're still friends, but not uh, close friends, I wouldn't say. But we, uh, we're raised pretty good friends. But uh, in that debate, in preparation for that debate, um, I remember him saying something to me. And I'm not identifying. So he may not even remember this. Probably doesn't. But it stuck with me. And in that debate... We were talking, uh, I, I don't even really remember the debate topic, but he said something to the nature of, uh, about how, um, it, about the exclusivity of the churches of Christ, okay, and that everybody else was outside and we were the inside, okay, uh, that's the best way to put it without getting too uh, in, the in the weeds, and I remember not even the exact words he said, I, even though I think I could probably get close, I remember what I thought. And what I thought 
in that moment was we finally converted him. He had come to believe that, I had come to believe that a person became converted into the church when they believed that everyone else was wrong. He had, his identity to me, whether or not a person was identified with Jesus or not, was not whether or not they served the poor, was not whether or not they loved Jesus, was not whether or not they got those first big things right. His identity to me was when he could recognize that everybody else was wrong. His identity was not what he stood for, it was what he stood against. And I think he's progressed out of that, uh, and uh, thankfully so. But I recognize that for the most part, when we get into this concept of a book that's really telling everybody, listen, get it through your thick skulls, it's only Jesus that's going to save you, okay? You can't earn this, you can't, uh, you, you just have to be on Jesus' side. You have to put your faith into Jesus, that you're not going to be able to earn your way into this. Well, that, this, the whole book of Galatians is about that. And it takes a lot for me to get there. Because I still have these nagging feelings that I'm not doing enough, that I've got too much sin, that, that God's up there doing this weighing thing where he's weighing my sins against my goodness and that my sins are going to slightly outweigh and Daniel's going to get to heaven and say, you missed it by point one of a point, you were so close. You know, and and I, 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 <laughs> that's not how things work, but my mind still comes back to that. Okay? It's, it's kind of where I, I come from. And so when I come to you talking about these things, I just want you to know where I've come from. When we study a passage, you need to know several things about the context. You need to know uh, kind of the immediate context, what's happening in that, in that book, in that situation. We're going to talk about that. You need to know the broader context. Where does this fit in the Bible? Because the Bible is one cohesive story that God is telling. And then you also need to know what baggage you're bringing into the Scripture. And that's the hardest part. Because... You know, we are all spiritually formed by something. You cannot not be spiritually formed. We're in a class. Uh, we're, we're on break right now from classes. Uh, uh, one, uh, because of the COVID surge. And we've, uh, Ed is out, by the way. Ed had elbow surgery this week, and everything went well uh, with him, which we're thankful for. But he's going to be out for a couple weeks. So we're taking a, a break from classes for a few weeks. But we're, we're talking about spiritual formation. And one of the things I started that class was reminding you, you are formed spiritually by something. And you may say, well, I, I have no spiritual background. Well, that is your spiritual background. Your spiritual background it may be that you uh, are uh, against religion. Well, that is a spiritual formation that you went through. We're all formed by something. And you can't move beyond or change or transform, as Romans was telling us about the transformation of the heart, until you kind of recognize where your heart is. And so I want you to recognize where my heart is. And when I come to a book like Galatians, uh, I'm immediately going to be a little bit defensive. And I'm going to want to start putting asterisk by things. Yeah, that scripture says that. But here's the scripture over here that says this. And, and I want to have a heart that doesn't do that. That just comes to scripture and tries to just see what scripture is telling me. And, and that's tough. And I ask myself, why is that? And I had this quote going around. It's really not. It's about deliverance. Okay? And it's been going around my mind for the last few weeks since I heard it. Uh, it's by one of my friends, Keith Stoneheart. Keith preaches for the uh, Fultondale Church of Christ just up the road. And he said this. He said, God is not just able to deliver you. He is available to deliver you. We don't think he is available because we probably wouldn't be if we got right down to it. And that's not really a, a quote uh, about legalism. Maybe it is. But it's a quote that reminds me that sometimes we decide how God would fall on an issue based on how we would fall on an issue. God becomes our puppet. Well, I don't like that, and I've come to this conclusion, so God must not like it either. And so I can go and I can tell people, listen, God would act this way on the subject. And you might say, well, why, Daniel, would God act that way on the subject? And the answer truly is, we wouldn't say it out loud, it's because that's how I would act on the subject. And we need to be reminded that God does not look at things the way we look at things. 
And when we come to a passage that's really talking and, and putting down some people who are trying to bring legalism back into a church, we need to be reminded that God sees things so dramatically different and that we're not overlaying ourselves on God, but we're letting God lay into us and overlay us and we're clothing ourselves with God daily. That's tough. That's the work of a Christian. It's a lifelong journey. And no matter what you have, you've got some baggage, and not all of it's right. You know, nobody is all right on everything, and nobody's all wrong on everything. Uh, there may be some people that are all wrong on everything, but we won't get into that. But nobody's all right about everything. We need to recognize that. So, digging into this book of Galatians. Galatians is a book written by Paul. Um, there's uh, some debate about exactly when it was written uh, because there's a, an important historical event that we read about in the book of Acts uh, where the Jerusalem council, the people from all the churches, the little house churches and things, all the elders from the town, they all come together to meet about something. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. And there's some debate about whether or not this was written before or after that. But it's written to a group of churches that are young and mostly Gentiles. But they're Gentiles, that mean they're not Jews, so they're coming in with different baggage than the Jews come in with. Okay, And so they're coming into this setting where they don't have the background of Judaism. Now, we are, are grafted into the Jewish faith. In many ways, we are still part of the Jewish faith. We sometimes want to say, well, we're Christian, not Jews. Well, well, there, there's a continuum here, okay? Many of the things that we even do today are rooted in the Jewish faith because that's our Bible. Our Bible consists not of 27 books, but of 66 books. Now, the rituals of those 39 first books, we're not still bound to. We're gonna, that's exactly what they were trying to do to this early young Gentile church is bind some of those rituals. But that story is still our story. Uh, the truth of God it still exists in those stories. How we got to where we are is still in those stories. That's our background and our story. And so we're reminded a little bit about legalism and how it can seep in. I want to give you a quote real quick from David Platt uh, before we go any further into this. He says, while the concept of grace, which is what we're talking about, this is a concept of grace, which is the alternative to legalism, of God making peace with us and not the other way around, not us trying to make peace with God. What happens is when we try to make peace with God, we recognize our failure. It's completely far to most people in India. And he's talking about in this, in this commentary about um, how he had been to, on a mission trip to India. And there's, there's gods everywhere. Okay? Mil, the land of a million gods. People have gods literally sitting on their dashboard of their cab. Okay? There's a, they literally will find a god in everything and in everywhere. And... They, he says, listen, this concept of grace is, is foreign. Their, their people are making up all these gods because they, don't, they can't get there themselves, right? And so he says it's completely foreign. It's also a foreign concept to many in the churches in our own culture. The concept of grace can become foreign to even us. And he continues, he says, the very idea of God's unmerited, unearned favor is unique, revolutionary, and life-transforming. In reality, every human being struggles to grasp the biblical truth of God's grace. He continues later. He says, if we leave grace behind, we become like every other religion in the world. So understand, when we're talking about, talking about legalism, we are talking about grace. Because those two stand in contrast to each other. And we follow a, a, a God that is a God of grace. And praise God for that, because... As we even are going to go through this book of Galatians, we're not going to agree, agree on everything. And if we're not agreeing on everything, guess what? That means one of us is wrong. I don't think it's me. If it was me, I'd change my mind, right? And you're probably not going to think it's you, because if it was you, hopefully you would change your mind. Uh, but th the joy is that grace comes from God. So, Acts 15, verse 1, is this council that's happening in, in, in Jerusalem, Okay. And certain people are coming from uh, Judea to Antioch, and, and they were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you can't be saved. In other words, they are, we call these sometimes the, the Judaizing teachers, and they're, they come up and they show up all throughout the New Testament. They're, they're the masters of legalism. Many of them come from the sect of the Pharisees. And the Pharisees started as a really good idea. 
Pharisees started with the idea of, hey, let's get back to God. Let's get back to the Bible. Everybody's forgetting the Bible. Let's get back to it. Well, the problem was is they, in their uh, desire to get back to the gospel, wanted to get so detailed about how everybody needs to follow the law. They started making up laws that weren't even actually in the Bible. Weren't even actually in those first 39 books. And so now that attitude is still present when God, Jesus comes onto the scene and he butts heads with those Pharisees. Now we got churches forming and we've got the same thing happening. And we've got this whole group of Gentiles over here who have not been circumcised. And you can't be a Jew unless you're circumcised. It, it's like against the very nature of being a Jew. And so now the church is having to get together and put their heads together and make a decision. And, and I love the autonomy of local churches, but this kind of flies right in the face of it because it, they're getting together all the churches from the area to come to a decision about an issue. And so that's what happens. All the people come from Judea to Antioch, and they're going to get together all the people because there's these people that are teaching, according to the custom taught by Moses, that you can't be saved unless you are circumcised. And so this brings Paul and Barnabas into sharp a dispute and debate with them. They say, listen, that, that's not the gospel. The gospel is not by you going through a checklist of rituals that mark you as a Christian. That's not, as Paul will tell us in just a few minutes in Galatians, that's not even the gospel at all. And so Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. So they go, and all the apostles get together, and all the elders get together, and they come, and they actually end up sending uh, out a letter, okay, to, to say, listen, pump the brakes here. This is not what the gospel is. And so Paul is obviously on the right side of this debate. Well, the book of Galatians is written in the middle of this debate, either before or just after, but somewhere during the time this debate is still going on. And, and while this letter, you would think, would kind of clear things up, it doesn't clear things up, it, you still got people that are saying, well, that's, they're just wrong. They've went liberal. They can't be telling the truth anymore. So that's exactly what happens with the book story. So in Galatians, Paul is waging war on legalism, and we want to notice that this is an environment that's ripe for it. Why is this environment ripe for legalism? Well, it's right because you've got a bunch of really young Christians who are just learning and they're soaking things in. If you've ever had the joy of sitting down with a new Christian and you just see them just, you know, they're like a, uh, y'all Y'all will appreciate this analogy. Y'all down here in the South, people up North won't get this. If anybody's watching up North, I apologize. But a new Christian is kind of like when you go to the barbecue restaurant and they got that real fresh white bread and you, you, we call it sopping, right? We sop it in that barbecue sauce, don't we? Just soak it in, okay? New Christians just soak it in. And, and you know, we don't even know what's in the barbecue sauce. We just know it tastes good, so we just soak it in. And many times young Christians, they're susceptible because they're just trying to soak everything they can in. And so a young Christian who doesn't have a background in in Judaism and Christianity and anything, well, they're coming in and you got this new guy coming in here teaching something and you might say, well, that's, that actually sounds pretty good. They make a, a logical argument. Well, they're sopping everything in these young, mostly Gentile churches and you get these Jews come in. They're like, well, they're the experts, right? They were around this before Jesus ever existed. And, and surely they would know how Jesus and we are supposed to kind of interact and meld together. Well, so we have an environment that's leap, that's ripe for somebody to bring some teaching in that's not the gospel. And so with that context, let's jump in to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 1, the first five verses, we're going to kind of hit real fast because there's some concepts there, but we're going to see them come back up again later, and we're going to spend the time on them later. We're going to really focus on verses 6 through 10 today. But we're going to go through book Galatians starting today, and we're going to go through every verse. So uh, get your Bible out, start reading it this week. You can read Galatians in one sitting. You can listen to it. I was on the road yesterday, and I just put it on my, on in my car, and I just listened to it on the way. Uh, so you can read through this book pretty fast, but it, it's a, a book that has been really important in Christian history, maybe more than any other uh, outside of the Gospels and Acts, I would say. So here's Paul, who is an apostle. He's identifying himself as an apostle. This is important because many of the people who are legalists are defeating what Paul says, not by defeating Paul's words, but trying to defeat Paul himself. 
saying Paul can't say that because he's not actually an apostle. And because Paul became an apostle in a very different way than all the other apostles became apostles. And so they're saying, listen, Paul's not even actually an apostle. So Paul is going to solidify, both here and other places we're going to study later, that yes, I indeed am an apostle, and I was sent from men, not from men, nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. This is going to become real important because the information that is coming into the churches is coming from men. The people that are bringing legalism into the church is coming from men. Paul says, listen, I'm coming to you and I am a man, but I'm not sent from a man or men. I come directly from God who raised up Jesus from the dead. So he says, and all the brothers and sisters with me to the church in Galatia. This is his typical greeting. He says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. There's an evil age present. Evil age is present today, isn't it? So Paul's writing words that while they're written to a specific culture about specific legalism things, he's still writing to us today because legalism, while it may look different, can still come into our churches. And he says, <clears throat> our sins to rescue us from the present age according to the will of our God the Father to whom the glory be forever and ever. Amen. This is a, a greeting it's actually a little bit on the shorter side of opening greetings for Paul. He doesn't get into naming any names or saying, hey, say hey to this person to me or that sort of thing. Because Paul is about to get directly to the point. Let's see it. I am astonished. I am blown away. I cannot fathom. I cannot believe. That you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ. And are turning to, notice this, he says, a different gospel. You're turning to, you know, gospel. We know what gospel, we, we really probably need to spend some time defining gospel. And we will some during this. But just the real short synopsis for us today is the gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ was sent. Born of a virgin. Died a a sinner's death, despite his perfection, he was buried, he rose again on the third day, and that resurrection creates for us the possibility of having the same resurrection. He becomes the first fruits for us. We have hope. That's just the gospel. That's the simple gospel that Jesus Christ came, and he lived and he died, and he lived a perfect life, and he was risen from the dead, and it's good news because we get to tap into that. We get to be a part of that. Not because of good works that we do, but because God has adopted us into it. He says, and while I call it a different gospel, verse 7, he says, it's really no gospel at all. What people are trying to pull you back into, and what people are trying to bring you back into, it's not really good news at all. Because they're trying to get you back into the mindset. They're trying to change your frame of mind and in that frame of mind, they're trying to tell you, you've got to do some meritorious works. Meritorious means that you, you gain something from it, right? So they're trying to get you to do these works, do these physical things, and they're trying to draw you back in. And by the way, there, there are two main things that they're trying to bring them back into, okay? One is the circumcision of the flesh. The other is regarding food laws, which we'll see some as we go. That they're calling back in to listen. You got you got to follow the, the all these iotas and details of the law. Many of those food details put in by the Pharisees, by the way, went beyond what God ever taught about food laws. So it's, and they're trying to drag you back into the, the weeds, as I like to say. That they're trying to drag you back into little minutia detail. And by the way, some of the details weren't even right. And they're they're trying to convince you that you're going to be saved. From the details. When in reality you're going to be saved by Jesus Christ. Died. Jesus Christ resurrected. We follow that same pattern. We're saved by the big picture. First Corinthians talks about that. That, that of things of first importance. That Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. That's the first importance. The most important thing. If you miss everything else, don't miss that. He said, but you got people that are trying to pull you back into something that 
has just enough flair, just enough influence, just enough look to look like it might be from God, that has pieces of, of Judaism and Jesus with it, but they're trying to pull you back into something that really, in all reality, what they're teaching is not even gospel. It's not even good news. Because you're pulling right back into the same thing where you're trying to save yourself by your good works. And we went through thousands of years where men were trying to save themselves by the law and no one was able to do it. They were unable to do it. Why? Because it's not possible to save yourself. And so people, evidently some people, are throwing you into confusion and they're trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. And I'm reminded here, Paul's talking to a bunch of mostly young Christians. So when he says, I'm astonished... I don't know if he really is astonished as much as he's just trying to get their attention and say, you know, you're a young Christian. It shouldn't really surprise Paul that young Christians kind of getting pulled apart from the gospel. Uh, even though this is like being pulled away from the main thing, right? And he says, listen, I'm astonished. He's really wanting them to get your attention. Listen, wake up because what you're being taught is not a gospel at all. People are trying to throw you into confusion. They're trying to put all kinds of extra into your head and, and what happens is all that stuff starts floating around and all of a sudden we're right back to square one where we're trying to decide who is a christian and who is not a christian by who's following this detail and who's following this detail and who's following this detail instead of keeping the main thing the main thing and we've got to be able to people be people who keep the main thing the main thing and he reminds them listen you got these people and they're throwing you confusion because they're and he uses this term pervert. And we use perversion frequently in our culture as a sexual thing. But in reality, it's not it, while it can be applied to sexual things, it's not necessarily a sexual word. It's a word that just means that, that it's, been, it's been infiltrated with something that's not supposed to be there. Okay, think of, think of somebody who's doing a lab experiment and something gets into the sample that's not supposed to be there. That, it's been perverted. Okay, it's been contaminated. Contaminated is a good word. And they're trying to contaminate the gospel of Christ. They're trying to teach you that you need Jesus and this. When in the reality, we need only Jesus. He continues, verse 8. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. You want to bring legalism back into the church? You need to understand the consequences of bringing legalism into the church. You make the good news not the good news anymore. You need to understand the consequences. Paul says, let God judge the people who are going to try to bring legalism back into the churches. As we've already said, so now I say again, if anyone's preaching you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. I taught you the big things you needed to know. And if anybody comes along and teaches you something that perverts that, you need to understand that that's no gospel at all. Then verse 10, he reminds them, listen, what I'm saying is not going to be acceptable among some people. There's going to be people that don't like what I'm saying because, you know, the, these Jews, they made their, their identity, these, the, specifically the Pharisees, their identity was marked by standing, you know, we're not just Jews, we're the very special Jews who've got it all figured out. He says, and Paul's coming in and saying, listen, you got to, they got to shut up. They need to be quiet. He says, now am I trying to win the approval of human beings? He says, listen, what I'm saying is not going to be popular among some people. And it's not going to be popular among some people who may have some power. Who may have some power inside the churches. But he says, listen, I'm, I'm standing up here and I'm not trying to tell you things you want to hear. I'm not trying to tickle your ears. I'm trying to tell you things that I think, that I know God wants you to hear. Now, I just want to remind you when I go through this series that I'm, this is why I'm trying to do. Now, I'm not an inspired apostle, okay? I can still mess some things up. But I realize when I, when I start talking about legalism, I still start talking about legalism in the churches of Christ, uh, immediately, I mean, I know because I, I do this too. I still do this. When people start talking about that, I start throwing up guards like, ah! You know, I'm going, no. That's not legalism. This is why. And I give them legal reasons why that's not legalism. Anyway, 
Uh, you need to remember, we're not trying to do this because we're trying to make people happy. We're trying to do this because we want to be in touch with what God wants us to know. And he says, am I trying to please people? He says, if, we're still trying to be, if, if I were still trying to please people, I'd still be a Jew holding coats, persecuting Christians. I had a good group of friends over here who patted me on the back, and, and Paul's going to talk about this next week. I was ad, he was advancing in Judaism. He was, he was going to be the stuff. He says, if I really wanted the path of least resistance, I wouldn't tell you the things you don't want to hear right now. But the problem is, is not telling you that means that I, too, am joining in perverting the gospel. He says, if I were still trying to please people, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. And I just want to remind us that as we go through this study and we start talking about some of these ways in which legalism can come into our churches. And by the way, I want to be real careful because when we leave legalism, and this is the danger, it is possible for us to go into liberalism. Okay, And liberalism, by the way, this is really important for us to know, is not probably, if you were raised in the Church of Christ, what you were raised hearing liberalism is. Okay, Liberalism has some really, really like things that have been established for a long time what liberalism is. So it's not like, man, that church down the street, they started doing music a little differently than we do. They're liberals. You know, you've heard that language if you were raised in the Church of Christ. That's not what liberalism is. Liberalism, very specifically, and, and there's two or three markers that are like the big ones. One is leaving the traditional sexual ethics teachings of the church. One, and the big one, is to start teaching that the resurrection of Jesus didn't actually happen. Okay, that's liberalism. All right. When you get into this this postmodern way of thinking where truth is just kind of subjective. Yeah, maybe Jesus. Jesus was a good guy, brought us good teachings, but I kind of don't think he was raised from the dead. That's liberalism. Okay. so when we leave legalism, there's this pendulum that swings. And sometimes what happens is people leave legalism and they come all the way over here to true liberalism. We don't want to get there. We want to try to find ourselves right here resting in the grace of God. Believing in the truth of Jesus. Believing that Jesus and our faith in Him is what ultimately is going to save us. Not anything more. Not anything less. It's only Jesus. And let's not swing over here. But I know in my life I've had to make this turn. And sometimes when a pendulum swings it's tough to find your bearings. I've, I've had the struggle in my life. Luckily, I've had good friends that have, have guided me through to make sure I don't come so far over here that I leave Christianity. But we want to find the truth here. And what I've found is in the middle, there's many times not a whole lot of friends in the middle. Um, there's a lot of times, a lot of people who are here and here that are still saying, you got to come back over here to legalism. And there's some people over here who say, man, you're, you're still a legalist. You know, and they don't really understand what legalism is. And let's be honest, nobody's in the church today, you know, we talked about this context, right? We've got to have context. We've got to understand both our context and the context of what was happening in that time. Well, there's nobody in the con. You, you haven't had anybody pulling you aside and say, listen, uh, you've just been a Christian. We've got to make sure you're circumcised. Okay, that's not happening in our churches. But we do have to understand and see, well, what, where is legalism in our churches? We'll make sure that we find ourselves here in the middle, resting in the grace of God with balance, balanced teaching, balanced thinking, balance in such a way where we rest in understanding that we can't see God by our own doing. It is truly and only a gift. That God gives us. There's no asterisk to that. There's no buts. Okay, and, and I know the first thought that's going through your mind. If you were raised in the church of Christ. I know the first thought that goes through your mind. When you hear somebody say that. So what about baptism? What does baptism have to do? With? We'll get there. Okay. But it's only Jesus. You're not earning your way. If you think baptism is a meritorious work. Something that you have done to earn Jesus. Then you, you missed it altogether. Only Jesus. Okay? Only Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less. Only Jesus. I hope that you 
uh, we'll start this week in Galatians, and let's just go through this, and let's have some uh, enjoy some time in the text together. Let's have a quick word of prayer, and then we'll uh, have a song of encouragement after, and then we'll uh, be able to join in communion together. Jesus, we thank you. God, we thank you. Spirit, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the words that are on the screen, that Jesus alone is enough. And may we put our hope and our faith and our trust in that and that alone. In Jesus we pray. And the church together says, Amen. Amen, amen. If you have any spiritual need, we would love to be your family that helps meet that need. You can let us be, let it be known. If you're watching online, t let people, there's people that are part of our church watching with you right now that love to minister to you. We can reach out through this week. Let it be known, or if you're here in person, let it be known while we'll stand and sing.